we are going to go over kind of the basics of how to make a loaf of sourdough bread and how to feed our starter and what exactly it all means. Now there are a lot of different thoughts on how complicated sourdough is. Some people just say mix it to the right consistency. Don't weigh anything. It doesn't matter what flour you use. It doesn't matter what water you use. There are some people that say it has to be exact. You have to wait this amount of time. It has to be this temperature. I don't follow either of those rules. I'm kind of somewhere in between. So I can only tell you what has worked for me. I started this starter about a year and a half ago now. So whenever I want to use it, I take it out of the fridge. I let it sit on the counter for a couple of hours. Um, sometimes it'll start to bubble and rise again. Sometimes it doesn't, depending on how long it's been in the fridge. But when I want to use it, either that night or the next morning, I feed it, which is I use 50 grams of starter, 100 grams of flour, and 100 grams of water. The water, I usually have it at about 80 degrees. Um, too hot, you'll damage the starter, too cold, and it's gonna have a really hard time getting going. It's gonna be very sluggish. So once I take my 50 grams of the starter, so which, whatever you have, as where you're starting it, that's your starter. Okay, so you put the 50 grams of starter into a jar with the 100 grams of water and the 100 grams of flour. Mix it up and then you just let it sit. Um, I know I've heard a few people say, well, mine doesn't get all the way up to the top of my jar and overflow. I see everybody has these starters that are overflowing. That's because they're starting out with more in the jar than you are, most likely. Um, so this starter, you can see, this has more than doubled. So it is possible to just have a very, very active bubbly starter. But if you're starting out with a teeny tiny bit and you have a very large jar, it's not gonna get to the top. It's not gonna bubble and overflow. Um, if I were to start out with any more starter, say if I my rubber band was just half an inch higher, it might have come up all the way to the top and overflowed. It really depends on how warm your kitchen is or how healthy your starter is to begin with. So if it's not getting to the top of your jar and overflowing, that's okay, it doesn't have to. If you're gonna be doing a big baking day and you are mixing up a larger starter, so it's more than 100 grams of flour and water, then you're going to have more rise because you're starting out with more, okay? So this is what we call our starter. When you go to make something and you take some out, that's called the discard. I know that can be really misleading because it sounds like it's garbage because discard means to get rid of. It's something unwanted, You're discarding it. But that discard is actually what we take and we use to make things. We never get rid of our starter. We keep our starter, we feed our starter, we love our starter. But discard, I always feel like that's kind of a misleading word. Discard is what we're going to use to make our bread, our cinnamon rolls, our crackers, whatever you want to make out of sourdough, pancakes, the list goes on and on. That's what you're going to use and make things with. So don't discard your, your discard. That's what you're going to keep and make things with. You always want to make sure you leave some behind though to feed and then your starter will continue on. It just keeps going and going and going. You feed it a little bit, you take a little bit. You feed it a little bit, you take a little bit. And that's just the balance that you maintain. So today I already have, as you can see, I have some loaves of bread here going. I prefer to only bake once a week at the most. So this I'm doing extra to be able to have a few in the freezer um, and also to be able to make a video to explain this a little bit better. So I am going to lose my train of thought. So I am going to measure out how much starter I have in here. I don't remember how much I fed it last night. <laughs> so we're going to measure this out and we're going to make some extra bread here. And then I will go over how to feed it. And then I'm going to put it in the fridge because I don't have any intention of baking a third time this week. Our little spatula here. I prefer to use a digital kitchen scale. I know there are lots of people who don't use a scale at all. And that's fine if that works for them. But when you're starting out and you don't know the consistency that you're looking for, you don't know exactly what it's supposed to be like, it really is helpful to have a scale so you can build that skill so you have the knowledge. 
it really is helpful to have a scale. I really, really do recommend it. All right, so I am going to make a double batch of bread today. So that is going to be, make sure our scale is zeroed out here. That's going to be 900 grams of water. It's about 80 degrees. And then to that, I'm going to add 200 grams of the starter or the discard. Zero that out again. in the bowl there it's really floating well the starter is very active and bubbly it had peaked which mean means it came up to the top of where it was going to rise to it got to its highest point so I'm just gonna stick my hand in here get it mixed up a little bit zero out my scale again and now I'm going to add 1,325 grams of flour. So this is a double batch, like I said, that I'm making. I will include the instructions below for a single loaf. Then we're going to add 36 grams of salt. I use Redmond's fine salt for this. There are a lot of people that will mix the flour, water, and starter together and then let it sit for 20 minutes and then add the salt with a little bit more water in. I've done it both ways and honestly I don't see much of a difference. All right, so we have our starter, our water, our flour, and our salt all in our bowl here. And we're just going to mix it up. Right, the first mix that we're going to do is going to be the messiest. We really just want to incorporate all of the ingredients together and end up with a shaggy looking dough like that. It's still going to be a little bit wet. It's still going to have a little bit of dry spots here and there. And for the next two hours, every 30 minutes, we're going to stretch and fold. So we'll do a four corner stretch and fold. So we'll take one side, stretch it out, and fold it over. Turn the bowl a quarter of a turn, stretch it, fold it, and keep going around. So we'll do that four times. 
and then we'll cover it, let it rest for 30 minutes, and then we'll repeat doing that. And each time it'll get a little bit less sticky and a little bit more soft and stretchy, and that's the gluten developing in the bread. Be sure to clean your hands off as best as you can, because if you have never heard, dough is like cement in your drains. If it gets in there and it dries, it's a terrible, terrible problem. So always be sure to clean as much dough off of your hands as you can. Now that we have mixed up our loaf of bread, we have this little bit of starter left over and we have to feed this so that it will keep growing and we'll be able to use it again. So you can use the same jar that it's in. Just for this, I'm going to transfer it to a clean jar just so we can see a little bit better. So I place my jar on my scale, make sure it's on zero, and I'm gonna put 50 grams of the starter into the clean jar. The wider mouth jar, the better. <laughs> I just didn't have any upstairs here. But the next time I go to feed my starter, I'll have this jar cleaned out and I'll go back to using that jar. So now we have our 50 grams of starter in here and we're going to add 100 grams of flour and 100 grams of water. Give it a good mix. And there we have it. We have our freshly fed starter. I'm gonna let this sit on the counter for an hour or two, just till it starts to show a little bit more signs of bubbling. And then I'm gonna put a tight lid on it and I'm gonna put it in the refrigerator for the next probably week or two. And when I want to get it out, I'll set it on the counter, loosen the cover a little bit and see how bubbly and active it gets. If it rises a lot, um, I will take from that and use for baking. Um, if it seems a little bit sluggish, if it's not rising a lot, then I will feed it again and wait. Depending on how warm the kitchen is, it's usually about eight to, ten, to eight to 12 hours. And then use that freshly risen starter. Another thing I wanted to clarify about the starter is the ratio that you feed it. So I feed mine a one to two ratio. So the one ratio is 50 grams of starter. The two and two is two parts. So it's two parts flour and two parts water. That's where we get the 100 grams of flour and the 100 grams of water. Now, another good thing to look at is the recipe you're going to use. If your recipe calls for 100 grams of active bubbly starter and you're doing a one to two ratio, you're gonna end up with 250 grams of starter once it's at its peak and it's risen. So that will leave you with, uh, with enough to do two loaves of bread because it's 100 grams and 100 grams. And then you'll still have that 50 grams of starter left, left to feed and then continue on growing your starter. 
So now it's been about a half an hour. We're going to do our first stretch and fold. Let's stretch fold. Grab one edge and fold it. Push it down. Go a quarter of a turn. Another quarter of a turn. Another quarter of a turn. And if you do an extra one or two, that's fine. But the minimum of four stretch and folds is good. And you can see it's kind of coming together a little bit more even now. It's not quite as slimy. As you see, that looks much better than when we first started out. It's coming together and it'll come together more and more each time we do it. So now we're gonna cover it up, wait another 30 minutes and we'll do another stretch and fold. Now this is going to sit on the counter for about eight to 12 hours. We're gonna go over a little sourdough shaping and it's been sitting overnight. Last night when I went to bed, it was probably right about four and a half quarts worth. And when I got up this morning, it was touching the cover. I've been kind of playing with it and checking it out here, admiring all the spider web nest that's in there. So I'm going to dump this out and I'm going to get it shaped and into our bowls so I can go into the fridge. Those look somewhat even. Now there are many different ways of shaping dough. So it's kind of whatever you find that works the best for you and that you enjoy doing. I don't really know if there's even a wrong way. <laughs> but I normally like to fold mine in thirds and then roll end to end. And then as you gently pull, 
uh, towards you, it's creating surface tension. So you're sliding it across the counter and it's tucking itself, the edges underneath itself. So there's a little bit of the seam here. So it's a push and pull. It's gentle. If you start to see it breaking, then that's too much surface tension. But just a few times back and forth and you get a nice tight little loaf. You might see bubbles pop up. You can pop those right away or you can leave them there. thirds, roll end to end, and then we're just going to gently push and pull. And as I'm pushing away from me, I rotate it a quarter of a turn and then pull it back, push it and rotate it a quarter, pull it back. And the more you do it, the more used to it you'll be, and you just kind of go and you don't even really think about how you're doing it. But like I said, it's different for everybody. <clears throat> push, rotate, pull back. Push, rotate, pull back. I prefer to do one big sourdough baking day for a week or week and a half instead of baking bread every day. I don't have time to do sourdough every day as much as I would love to. It's just not possible with my schedule. So I like to figure out what day I have available and then just make four or five or even six loaves and just get it all done with right away. If it's sticking to you a lot, you can wet your hands a little bit and that'll keep the dough from pulling away and making a terrible mess. It's always better to add a little bit of water on your hands than flour when working with sourdough. I'm gonna let these sit on the counter now for about 20 minutes. It lets the top dry out a little bit, forms kind of a crust, and then we'll put them in our bowls and get them in the fridge. Now that these have sat for about 20 minutes, I'm just going to give them a little bit more shaping and then get them in my baskets here. And these are going to go in the refrigerator for anywhere from one to 24 hours, depending on when you have the time to bake them. I usually will wait about eight hours. So if I mix it up in the morning, like I am now, this evening, probably after dinner time, I'll bake. If I mix them up at night after dinner, I put them in the fridge, and then in the morning, I will bake them after breakfast. This is, I think it's a fairly flexible thing to do. Yes, it might take some time, with the, the mixing and the stretches and the folds, but you really can plan it out to fit your schedule. It doesn't have to be time consuming. You don't have to have the fancy bowls. You could just use whatever bowls you have and a dish towel. These have formed a nice dry crust on them.
I have put some rice flour in the bottom of my bowls and baskets. You can use just the regular flour that you use to mix up the loaf. It doesn't have to be rice flour. All right, I have all of these in their baskets now. I'm going to go put them in the refrigerator in the garage and cover these up. And in about eight to 10 hours, I will get them out and we'll get them baked up. The next part of our sourdough bread is going to be scoring the loaves. Now it's best to use a very sharp knife. You don't have to use one of the razor blades, but really it does help to be able to make a nice deep cut. You don't have to do anything super fancy. It can be just one cut. You can do a design. You can make an X on it. It really doesn't matter. But the reason we want to have a nice deep score is because as the bread is baking, it is going to expand. And if you don't give it a place to expand, it's going to explode and you're going to get a very um, oddly shaped loaf. So for this one, we're just going to go top to bottom, a nice, nice deep cut here. I'll go back and even hit it a little bit more the second time. As you can see here, it is very nice and deep. So that is going to give a really good expansion point for the bread as it rises. So that's an example of just a very simple way to score it. Some people like to spray it with a little bit of water and then apply a little bit more flour. I normally just keep it pretty simple. This one I'm going to be a little bit more decorative here. And when you do decorative scoring, these cuts are a little bit lighter, more just surface deep. And then you have one deeper cut, that is your expansion point. Now I'm going to get to work on getting my loaves and my cast iron Dutch ovens and getting them in the oven. I bake them, well I let the pans preheat in a 450 oven for about 45 to 60 minutes. And then I place the loaves in the oven, in the Dutch ovens, uh, for about 40 minutes, give or take. If I'm doing one loaf, I will check it at 35 minutes, but when I'm doing multiple lo loaves, um, the oven's open longer, there's more things in the oven, so it tends to take a little bit longer.
I try to work as quickly as and safely as possible when doing that to limit the amount of time that the oven is open and the amount of heat that we're losing. Some people like to put ice cubes in the Dutch ovens because it helps the crust to blister a little bit more and it 